Okay, so uh, all that stuff said, we are in the book of Romans right now, and uh, I got to just take a second. Uh, so last Sunday, Pastor Josh uh, preached through Romans 14, did a great job, but on the way in, he said something that, that caught my ear, where he just mentioned, you know, like we've been in Romans for a while, and I know a lot of us are, are sick of it, and we're ready for Romans to be done. Uh, and we have been since January. So as he preached on Romans 14, he vocalized that people are tired of being in Romans, which is why today we're going back a chapter in Romans 13. <laughs> we're done when daddy says we're done. All right. All right. So, so if you have a Bible, open up to Romans 13. Uh, we actually, we will be done in a couple weeks, but, uh, uh, there's some stuff here. I like it. So, so look, just to get on the same page, here's, here's a little bit to know as, as like, cause we're 13 chapters, well now 14, but today's 13, uh, chapters in. So here's, here's the deal with Romans. So Romans was written by the apostle Paul in the first century to a church in ancient Rome that he did not start. And he's doing a few things in this letter that he writes to the Romans. Number one, he's just introducing himself. He's trying to get uh, support for a missionary journey to Spain. He's trying to help Jewish and non-Jewish Gentile Christians uh, get along to be one family in the faith. And he's also going, look, here's what the Christian faith is. Here's a snapshot. Here's what Christians believe. And so Romans is this beautiful uh, theological treatise that just encapsulates our faith wonderfully. And in chapters 1 through 11, he presents this thing called the gospel. Maybe you've heard that term before, gospel. It means good news. Here's what the good news is. The good news is that God has looked at you and he's looked at me with undeserved love and kindness. There really is a God who really does love you. Let me tell you the way that's played out. All of us have rebelled against God. All of us have done this thing called sin. And we've earned for ourselves disqualification from heaven and wrath. So the Christian faith is not, okay, if you're good enough, God will let you into heaven. That's not the faith at all. Like, we've rebelled against God. We, we, we should have been out. But what God did was, he sent Jesus into the world. And Jesus lived for us the life that we haven't lived. We sinned, he never sinned. And because he never sinned, he had the authority to take on himself the wrath that we deserve. Jesus died on the cross in our place. He shed his blood so that you and I could be made right with God. And now every person who believes that, that Jesus died for their sin and rose from the dead is given new life. And we get to live eternally with God forever. That's Romans 1 through 11. And then chapter 12 comes along. Paul goes, well, listen, the question becomes, what do we do with that belief? Like, if we believe that salvation is a gift from God through faith in Christ, then what that means is that, okay, like, we can never make God like us any more or any less, right? I mean... Like, if you're telling me that it's a gift, it means it doesn't rest on me, it rests on him. So, so, so how does that work? Like, what do I do with the rest of my life if salvation is a gift? And Paul goes, well, listen, this is where it comes into play, this idea of, of change. And so, if you believe that Jesus died for you, your response is to die to you. If you believe that, that Jesus ha has held nothing back from you, then the proper response is to hold nothing back from God. So, you're going to live every second of every day for the rest of your life for him. Not to be saved, but because you've been saved. This is your, as he would say in Romans 12 too, your true and proper worship. It's the, the, the logical thing you do with this knowledge of the gospel. And going forward, Paul uh, begins to apply this in different ways. This idea of dying to yourself. And now what he's going to do in chapter 13, he's going to wrap up that whole thought. Sort of like a fireworks. You know, like you, you see like for the July fireworks and it's like at the end there's always like the finale. Bum, 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 right? Okay, well here's, here's the bum, 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 bum thing. <laughs> and so he says this, uh, Romans 13 starting in verse 11. He says, and do this, understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. We're going to pause on this. I want just to understand what he's getting at in, in this thought. Okay, so when he says like, okay, like, you know, it's time for you to wake from your slumber. All right, what, what's he getting at? Well, what he's getting at is this. Okay, before you knew Jesus, you were spiritually a sleeper. You could even say you were dead. You weren't aware of all the ways that you were rebelling against God because your heart was callous. You weren't filled with the Holy Spirit yet. You just kind of went through life and, and you did whatever you were going to do. But what, what happened was when, when you believed in Jesus, the Holy Spirit came into you and he woke you up. It's kind of like, you know, have you ever had surgery? Like, like, like good anesthesia where like they put you out, right? And when you're under, they do unspeakable things to your body. Just atrocities. They're cutting you open. They're moving stuff around. That if you were awake, you'd be like, ah, you know. Oh, it was that funny, but okay. 
right? But, but, but you're numb, you're asleep. But then you wake up. Okay, well, the same is true with you spiritually. Like before you knew Jesus, you were asleep and you were doing all this stuff that was a rebellion against God. But then he woke you up. He made you alive. It's why, listen, like, if, if you don't know Jesus, I don't blame you for, for rebelling against God. You, you can't do any different. Your heart is still dead. But it's also why, hey, many for you, 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 you come to faith in Christ, and this has been your experience. You find yourself convicted about things that you were never convicted about before. Like, you would just kind of go through life, and you would do your, your own thing, and suddenly you did something that you used to do all the time, and you're just like, ah, I don't, I don't like, like, why did I do that? And nobody even had to tell you that it was wrong. There's just suddenly this thing like, uh, what was that? And that was okay, you've been made awake. The Spirit of God has come to reside in your heart. He begins to convict you about your sin. So you become more like Jesus. So that's this idea of awaking from the slumber. But then he, he contrasts night and day. And scripturally speaking, this has to do with actions. Like actions of darkness are associated with nighttime. And God is light in him. There is no darkness at all. And so it's contrast. Okay, like this is what your life looked like before. It was deeds of darkness. It was nighttime stuff. But now, like your deeds are going to change because you are people of the light. Because ultimately, Jesus is coming back. And so he says like our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. It's okay. Like the, you know, the sort of the, the countdown clock has started, right? Okay, we, we, like Jesus left and now, the, now as the clock winds down, he is coming back. And I know as I even say that, you're like, okay, but it's been a while. Like, where's he at? And, and also, Bert, how can Paul say this? It's, it's been 2,000 years. Like, like where's Jesus at? And you should just know that, that, even in the first century, when the scriptures are being written, people are already starting to adopt this cynicism of like, come on, man, how long is it going to be? Which is why uh, the apostle Peter can write this in 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. He says, above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. In other words, like, where is this Jesus returning thing? I mean, it just seems like life is the way it's always been. People come and go. People live and die. Like, where is Jesus at? And then Peter goes, yeah, but there's something you don't realize. So in verse 8, he says this, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a day. In other words, Time in the perspective of God is not like time in the perspective of us. And so we, we go, all right, he's coming back. When? I don't know. But I do know that it's very, very brief to him. All right. And so, it's like, man, where is Jesus? Like, well, like, what do I do if it's been this long? Like, how should I live if every generation before me has believed Jesus was coming back in their lifetime? Well, what I would tell you is, yeah, every generation has believed that Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. That's, that's true. But one generation will be right. And we're called to live like it's us. And so that's this idea of, okay, Jesus is coming back and our actions are being changed. Like we want to be people of the light, not of the dark. And so in, in verse 12, Romans 13, Paul continues. He says, the, earth, the night is nearly over. The day is almost here. And so what do I do with that knowledge? He says, so put, let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. And I underline that because I want you just to make a mental note. Like put a pin in that. That phrase is going to be very significant for us today as, as we dive into the scriptures. Okay. So he says, all right, put on the armor of light. So we're going to live like as people who are godly. We're going to like go after holiness. We're going to like run away from sin. So what does that look like? Verse 13, let us behave decently. Let us do the right thing as in the daytime. Contrasted with like nighttime. What was nighttime stuff? Not carousing and, and drunkenness. Okay, so carousing, that's a weird word. What's that mean? It, it means like living for an indulgence of your senses. So whether that be like gluttony and you're just like consuming food constantly or whether that be uh, other things having to do with pleasure, like carousing, like maybe drinking. That's why it's linked here with drunkenness because drunkenness is a sin. If you are getting drunk, you are sinning. Okay, like right here. Okay, like that is a deed of darkness. He continues, not in sexual immorality. Okay, what's sexual immorality? Okay, so we, we talked about this before. I'll just say it again. The Christian sexual ethic is this, that any sexual activity outside of one man and one woman in marriage is a sin. Between one husband and wife, it's, it's blessed by God. Go for it. Anything else, wrong. Well, how, okay, what about this thing right there? I would just say it like this. Um, if you would consider it cheating if your spouse did that, 
you should not be indulging in it outside of marriage. Okay, so yeah, we, we run from sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy, like this idea of like, you know, like, like dividing and, and getting petty and wanting what somebody else has, like all that stuff. Those are categorically deeds of darkness. And he says in verse 14, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Okay, so he's contrasting light and dark. And he says, remember, he says like, put on the armor of light. That's a weird phrase, right? Like, why, like, armor? Like, why not, like, trench coat or poofy hat? Like, why armor? Well, that language is significant. And Paul actually repeats it in his writings, and we'll look at that today. Um, here's the reality. This is his thought behind it. When we're talking about resisting evil and living for the Lord, when we're talking about, like, works of darkness versus works of light, here's the thing to realize, that Paul just assumes that you know. And if you're taking notes, here's the first thing I want you to write down today. Uh, we are in a real spiritual war. We are. This is not a thing of, oh man, I really don't want to sin. Oh man, I'm tempted as though it's just me on my own. Like, you know, there are spiritual realities. There are malevolent spirits. There are things that hate God and hate you that have been alive longer than you that want to kill you and ruin you and ruin your witness and, and like destroy your joy in the Lord and destroy your family. Like you are in a war right now and Paul's language reflects the reality of this. <laughs> we don't think about it like this. Like we think of it as, like, you, you talk about demons? Like, yeah. Well, no, no, I mean, I'm not seeing stuff like levitate or anything. Like I'm not, you know, like, well, okay. And yet the New Testament authors <laughs> just assume that you know that there can be all kinds of things spiritually happening behind very, very uh, common life things. Let me give you some examples, okay? So um, think about how uh, the Gospels, when they talk about the beginning of Jesus' ministry, they, they first tell a story of how he was tempted. Remember that? Can't all of us face temptation. The, like Jesus, you know, who is fully God and fully man, we should expect him to be tempted as well. Matthew 4 1 says it like this. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And, you know, he overcomes that temptation. He doesn't give in to it. And you remember how, how that story ends? Like, I like the way that, that Luke wraps it up. He says this in, in, in Luke 4.13, like the end of the same story. He says, when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. So it's not, okay, hey, he conquered Satan in the wilderness and he was never tempted again. That's not this. It's Satan tempted, tempted, tempted. Jesus said, no, he went, all right, I'm going to back up until I spot the hour of weakness again that I'm going for it, like the opportune time. This isn't just Jesus, which by the way, if it is happening to Jesus, we should expect it to happen to us because he's way more holy than we are. But it's not just him. Look, the, like the, the, the New Testament leaders, they expect you to know that this is going on behind the scenes in your life all the time. James says it like this in James 4, 7. He says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. It's not just James. Peter, the apostle Peter, writes like this in 1 Peter 5, 8. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Spiritual war is part of the experience of every single believer. Here's why this is important. Because okay? um, I say this and you're going to be like, wait, Subert, are you saying that every time I'm tempted it's a spirit? I don't know the exact breakdown. Am I saying that every temptation is a demonic entity? I don't know. I just know it's a lot more common than we think. I mean, if the scriptures are to be believed and the, and the experience of believers that, are, that is appealed to in the scriptures is to be believed, then this means that there are spiritual wars happening constantly in and around us. It happens a lot more than we give it credit. Look, I mean, just common things that, that we would never, like because of our 21st century Western mindset, we would never attribute to spirits. Let me just show you how the New Testament does. I won't even get it into physical ailments. Like just, and I'm not saying that every physical ailment is a spirit, but there are plenty of common ones that 
are attributed to that in, in the Gospels. Let's just talk about like life, temptation, character stuff. Hey, how about this? Um, are you tempted with pride? Are you somebody where, okay, man, like you, you, you're the smartest person that walks into the room, right? And you find yourself struggling against this belief of like, man, I'm just so great. I'm such a gift to this place and these people that I'm brought to. And you, and you love to be seen as wise and you love to have your voice heard. Okay, James 3.15. Such wisdom, quote unquote, does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Whoa. That's pride? Yeah, it's pride. Okay, how about this? Are, are you tempted sexually? All right, 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Okay, he's talking to married people. He says, do not deprive each other, uh, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time. So a very unique kind of fast, and both of you have to agree to it. So that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. That can be demonic, yeah. Okay, how about this? Do you struggle with unforgiveness and bitterness? And you hang on to grudges and you have a hard time letting go of stuff. Okay, well, 2 Corinthians 2, verses 10 and 11. Paul writes to this church, he says, anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. I mean, that's common stuff. Yeah. And, and when we talk about this war, here's what we've got to realize. In fact, if you're taking notes, write this down. This is the next thing I want you to realize. One of the worst mistakes we can make is to assume that unless a problem is overtly spooky, that means it's not demonic in origin. It's a terrible mistake. Okay, like, unless, you know, there's this smell of sulfur that comes in the room, and, and you know, like, I, I see, like, a shadow person, and, and, and things shake, and that, that's, okay, yeah, that's what happens, but to think that, okay, unless it's that way, if it, or to think, if it appeals to me, it means it's not demonic. Don't you know Satan masquerades as an angel of light? Don't you know that a person out of their own desires is tempted? Okay, like, so if, if you're prone to fear and you're prone to being crippled by fear, yeah, you, you might encounter dramatic things sometimes and other times it might just play on your fears. My point is this, to think that, okay, it's only a war thing unless, like, the, the, the heavens and the earth are shaking, that is such a mistake. Because we're seeing these common things here in the scriptures that are identified as, as the activity of your spiritual enemy. Look, I'll give you another one, like just to, to summarize like the whole principle, okay? So like Paul, he, he writes in, in Romans 13, he talks about armor of light, not the only place that he talks about armor. Let me show you the more famous one. This is in Ephesians 6, and this is the lead into his conversation about spiritual armor. He says, verse uh, 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against the natural, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Okay, like that's the struggle that you're in a war. Hey, um, maybe for you, you've got a thing you keep coming back to. You. A sin that no matter what you try to do, you're just never free. You've done the work gone to therapy and you've read books and maybe you've been in a group and, and, and you've had confession and accountability partners and all that stuff and nothing ever changes. Let me propose to you the possibility just the remote possibility that your struggle's origin is spiritual in nature and you've tried everything under the sun except for rebuking that spirit that's coming against you maybe going through deliverance and maybe praying with other believers for that in that way. Let me suggest to you that the scriptures are true, that your battle is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual entities that hate your guts. Maybe for you, you have this belief. And you're like, well, hold on, Bert. You're, you're, you're saying that, but like, no, no like, believers can't be touched by demons. To which I want to ask, where did you get that? You didn't get it from the Bible. That's nowhere in the Bible. 
In fact, if that were the case, this Ephesians passage would make no sense because, again, like Paul is writing to believers in Ephesians 6, and he's telling them that their struggle is not against flesh and blood. And then he's going to caution them to, to put on the armor of God. So like, where did you get this idea that, like, like the demons can't affect believers or go against them? I mean, like, like, if they went against Jesus, why would you think they won't go against you? Like, like where did you get that from? I'll tell you where you got it from. You got it from deductive reasoning that sounded really good, but had no scripture behind it. I've, I've received the Holy Spirit, so therefore nothing can come against me. Yes, you have received the Holy Spirit. Um, do you still have sinful thoughts? Do you uh, still have ailments in your body? Of course. Why? Because you live in the already not yet. You live in a time where, okay, like, like you've received the promise of life, but you're still in a fallen world. Let me suggest to you that perhaps you can still be affected by fallen things. So with that in the backdrop, Paul says this. Because I know you're going to like, well, okay, well, gosh, if you're telling me that that is the case, then how in the world will I make it? How, how, will I, how, will I, how will I have victory? Like, how will I go forward? How will I resist? If you're telling me there are spirits that are older than me who have had a lot of practice who want to destroy me. Well, Paul now says it. Verse 13 of Ephesians 6. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, like when you're tempted, when things are, are like raging against you, like when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Verse 14, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Truth, how? Okay, I, I see the world as it should be. I'm, I'm, I'm clothed with the truth of what God says about life and what's actually going on. All right? With the... Uh, the I'm sorry, with, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Like my heart is guarded with the righteousness of Christ. Like my, 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 my insides are protected like in terms of, okay, like this is how things actually are. We continue, he says, and with your feet fitted with the readiest that comes from the gospel of peace. Okay, I'm equipped to take the gospel where it is and I'm equipped to share my faith. I'm equipped to further the kingdom of God. Like in addition to all this, Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So okay, what's happening? Satan's throwing things against you, like whether that be shame, whether that be temptation, whether that be sin, right? And he's just tempted like, to throw all these things against you and convince you to believe that life is a certain way, that God doesn't have your best interests at heart, that to live this way is impossible, to believe that you'll never be free, to believe that you'll never change, to believe that this is just your thing. No, no, I hold up my shield of faith. I know who God is. I know what he said about life. Absolutely, I want that thing take root and hit my heart because I believe God and his words. The shield of faith. The helmet of salvation, he says. Verse 17, take up the helmet of salvation while your mind is guarded with the mind of Christ. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I'm going to unpack that one because that one gets even more fun. You know, how do I put it on? How I put on said armor. I know, like, man, we, we talk, like, we, like, if you've been in church for a while, you've heard this passage, and it's such, like, a great, like, it's a nice bookmark or t-shirt, you know? We love this passage. So we're asked how to put it on. But if you want to understand how you put this on, you have to understand what the armor is. So, like, Paul, like, who, who wrote this? Like, again, really well-meaning stuff. People will be like, well, you know, like, when Paul wrote this, he was probably in prison, and so he was probably looking at a Roman centurion, and he's comparing it to the armor that a centurion would be wearing. So, oh, great illustration. Yeah, that's not what's happening here. Uh, Paul, before he was a Christian, he was a Pharisee. And he knew the Old Testament really, really well. Like, really well. Like, shame us well. And there is language in the Old Testament that he is almost certainly using when he talks about this armor, particularly from the book of Isaiah. And I want to show it to you. Like, and so uh, the first place would be this. This would be Isaiah 11, starting verse 4. So he says, but with righteousness, the Lord will judge the needy. So what's happening is like, like the poor aren't being cared for. And, and Isaiah goes like, God will act on their behalf because he cares about the widow and the orphan. He cares about the poor, Okay. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And so we see a weapon coming out of the mouth of God. Why? That's going to be significant. Verse 5. Um, I'm sorry, sorry. End of verse 4. Rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Now, verse 5. Righteousness will be his belt. 
and faithfulness, the sash around his waist. Okay, it's like, what's he getting at? Okay, well, um, he's getting at the idea that God's character is seen by the world. So think of it like this. Um, in our culture, pretty fair to say in most, you can tell a lot about a person by the way that they dress, right? I'm not saying that we should judge somebody based on their clothing. No, of course not. And yet we learn things about people based on the way that they, they dress. We learn maybe their, their artistic or fashion sense. We learn maybe something about them financially in, in terms of what they'd be willing to invest in an outfit. We learn about you know, maybe security and insecurity based on uh, tightness of clothing or whatever, right? Okay. Uh, insecurity, covering up the belly right now. All right, so look. Um, okay. But okay, like we see externally something about the person internally. And this is Isaiah's idea right now. Like, okay, we know like, like God, he will judge on behalf of the poor. Like righteousness will be his belt because he does right. We can see this about him. So don't get tripped up on the, okay, well, but, right, it's righteousness here, but it's, but it's truth in the New Testament. You're missing the point. The point is God's character is revealed in these bits of clothing. They're symbolic of his nature. And that's why, by the way, a weapon comes from his mouth. Because when he speaks, things happen. And so, continue, like, this isn't isolated. Isaiah 49, verse 2. Isaiah, again, uses this idea. And he says, he says, he, talking about God, made my mouth like a, look at this, sharpened sword. Remember, sword of the Spirit, the Word of God? He made my mouth like a sharpened sword, and in the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. What's Isaiah talking about? He's talking about his commissioning from the Lord. God said, you're going to be a prophet. You're going to go. And what would happen? When Isaiah would speak, he would say, thus saith the Lord, and the thing would happen, right? Okay, why? Because it's the sword of the Spirit. What God says happens. So wait, Bert, are, are you telling me that the Bible isn't the sword of the Spirit? No, it contains the sword of the Spirit. Because it is the word of God, and yet the word of God is so much more. Like, by his word, the heavens and the earth were formed. Like, when God speaks, something happens. This is why, hey, when you're reading the Gospels, and you find Jesus commissioning his disciples and his apostles, and he sends them into towns, even before he's died for their sin and risen from the dead, remember, he still gives them authority to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, cleanse the lepers. Like, he still does that even before the inauguration of his shed blood in the kingdom. How? Because he said it. All right, go do this. I give you authority. Because when God speaks, it happens. That's the sword of the Spirit. The word of God. Like when God says something, it happens. That's the idea right here in Isaiah 49. I, I could continue. Okay, look at this. Isaiah 59, jumping forward 10 chapters. Like he looks at the world. He laments the lack of righteousness. He says, truth is nowhere to be found. And whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. Okay, so God's looking at the earth and he's not seeing anybody living faithfully for him. Now watch this, verse 16. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. Okay, so since nobody is living faithfully for God, God does it himself. Okay, and how does he do it? Like, you're going to expect him. Okay, is he going to, is he going to put his armor on an angel? Like, or is he going to tell him an angel to armor up, right? And go live faithfully for the Lord? Oh, no, no. Because God's going to listen. Nobody's going to do it. So I'm going to do it. And so watch this. Verse 17. He put on righteousness as his breastplate. What does that sound like? It's Ephesians, right? He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. Okay. Again, the context is God's holiness versus the corruption of the world. And so God goes, I, I'm putting these things, because okay, what you can learn about me, okay, like again, the, the clothing is indicative of the person's character. You can tell a lot about a person, by the way, that they dress. Now, here's why this is so important, okay? Here's why this is so important. You're like, why are you talking about this so much? Here's why. Because when it goes to the New Testament, now we start to understand why Paul can talk about get rid of the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Because it has all to do, okay, like how do I resist like the spiritual stuff? How do I have victory over it? Why is it armor, by the way? Uh, because armor endures against attack. So, so why, why is there this weird transition? Okay, because we see like, this is clearly what Paul is referencing. So, but, 
but he tells us to put on the armor. Like before God put on the, the armor. So like, why is it now this same stuff that God had on himself, he now tells us to put on. Here's the answer. If you're taking notes, write this down. God gives us his own armor because he gives us his own nature. Oh, this is cool. This is cool. So when I believe in Jesus, why is it I can overcome against sin? Because the very spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is in me, enabling me to become godly. I don't just say, I'm going to put on some random spiritual armor. No, no, it's the armor that God wore himself. And he goes, you put that on. And the way that you can is because I'm going to make you like me. Oh, this is awesome. This is so awesome. Okay, that basically what this means is the way that we put on God's armor of light is by living the life of light that Paul's talking about in Romans 13. That's how you armor up. It's not, okay, I'm going to imagine the helmet on my head. No, it's, I, I, I'm going to take captive my thoughts for the Lord. It's not, okay, like, uh, I'm going to just imagine putting on, like, you know, like some Kevlar. No, no, I'm going to guard my heart because I want to walk with Jesus. Righteousness, right? That's why, look, 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 just again, Romans 13, verse 12. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Why is that the contrast? Do this thing, do this thing, right? Don't do that so that you can do this. Why? Because deeds of darkness and armor of light, like the way that you put on the armor... And here's the next thing to realize. Write, write this down. The way to be equipped in God's armor is to live life the way he says to live it. And it's also, by the way, why we can be commanded to put it on even though we're already Christians. Have you thought about that? Like, like why is it he can tell Christians, like, you've got to put this on? I mean, aren't we secure in Christ? Yes, we absolutely are. And yet we can take off the armor because we can choose to rebel against the Lord. We can choose to, to open ourselves up to spiritual oppression by rejecting the life that the Lord has for us. And in so doing, of course, we open ourselves up to attack. Is it that, he, is it that our, you know, our salvation isn't, a, isn't secure or that he doesn't love us? No, he loves us. Our salvation is locked in. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Like, you know, he is our anchor in heaven, 100%. And yet, we can still do dumb things. And the way that God has wired the world, like it says God is not mocked. And whatsoever man sows, that he reaps. And so if you want to get away from that stuff, then what you do is you put on the armor of God. That's, again, guys, that's why Paul can say it like this, just continuing in, in verse 12. He says, so let us uh, put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently. So how do I put on the armor of light? Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Verse 14, rather clothe yourselves. Okay, so how am I clothed? I'm living the life of Christ. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Like wrap yourself in. Like when people see you, they should see the actions of Christ. Clothe yourselves in Christ. Actually, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I feel like, I, I like the NIV. Like, that's my, my default translation, but I don't think they really get the translation necessarily the best right here. So let me just, like, when we talk about this idea of, like, being clothed in Christ and uh, not thinking about how to gratify the desires of the flesh, I don't think that's as necessarily as active as, as the original Greek says. So actually, I like the way that the ESV translates it. They say it like this. Uh, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for the flesh. How to gratify its desires. I love that idea. Like make no provision. Literally in the Greek, it's, it's the word pronoia, which means forethoughts or foresight. So put on Jesus and we can say this, give no space for the flesh. And this is important. Because some of us, like, I, I, um, I'm saying this stuff of like, okay, listen, no, you need to live for Christ. And what you want to do like pragmatically is be like, okay, but like what about when I don't? Right? Okay, like, so what's this little space where, okay, like, if I sin, how much can I sin so that God will forgive me? And how do I, like, and what you're doing right there is you're creating provision for the flesh. You're giving room. You're giving forethought. Like, you're basically going, like, I expect to fall. And when I do, how will I know that God will sustain me? And you're already thinking about it wrong. Because according to this, what it says, it's like, you give no provision for it. You live as though you will never fall again. You do that in everything that you do. And if you fall, praise God, he's got you to stand you back up. 
But you don't live with this space of, okay, like how far can I go? And if I go that far, will he still keep me? You're missing the point if you're there because you make no provision for the flesh. There are no outs. There are no, okay, but what about this? And let me, like, what's, what's the contractual sort of little bit of like a loophole? There, no, it doesn't work like that. You put on Christ. You live his life. And you give no space for, what if I slip up? You approach it with the attitude, I'm not going to slip up. And the reason I'm not going to slip up is because the one who raised Jesus from the dead is in me. And I know, guys, I've been pastoring long enough. I've been living long enough to know the, 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 the pushbacks and to hear the conflict in so many hearts. I mean, oh, Bert, I just, I just can't shake this. Bert, you don't understand. Like, you know, this is the history of my family and this is how we are as a family and we're just this. And, Bert, you don't know how many times I've prayed and I've fasted and I've asked and, and you don't know like, like, like what I've gone through and, 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 and <laughs> I, 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 I will just, I, it's not that I lack the intention. I want to love God, but I'll just always be this way and I know I have to give into this and have to give into that. And it's, when you hear that nonsense... Here's the question I want to ask you. Who are you going to believe? Who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe spirits who are by nature liars? Are you going to believe spirits who hate your guts, who want to kill you? Or are you going to believe God's word? Like, as I'm faced with temptation and I'm faced with wanting to rebel against God, am I really going to say that he hasn't given me enough? Am I really going to say that, okay, if I choose to rebel against him, life will be better? Am I really going to be so arrogant like that? Am I going to lie that way? Am I going to believe demons or am I going to believe the living one? Am I going to believe the one who's been so selfless for me that he's shed his own blood? Am I going to believe that the author of life actually knows how life should be lived and actually knows how to get the most joy in life? And you hear these things, and you'll always be like this. And you'll always be like that. And you have to give in. And you have to do that. I want to just tell you, no, you don't. No, you don't. You know how I know you don't? God's word. 2 Timothy 1.7, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. That's either true or it's not. Well, I don't feel it. Who cares about your feelings? Is this true or not? Like, have I really received the Spirit of Christ? And then, if I have, I don't have to be afraid of falling. I don't have to be afraid of giving in. I don't have to be afraid of demons. And I also, uh, so I'm not timid, but I also, listen, I have power. I have power to overcome, and I have love. And when I'm tempted to be bitter, and I'm tempted to not forgive, no, no, according to this, I can love my enemy. And self-discipline, no, I don't have to give in to this or that. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's in me. Yes, I can have victory. Why? Because Jesus said that I can. And his word is a sword. And guys, I know, like, I say this stuff and you're like, well, that's uncorking a very big bottle. Because you're telling me that perhaps at root my struggle might not be completely natural but actually spiritual. Yeah. Yeah. It's been weird. Um, more and more during the last year, I, I've been with folks who, as we prayed, it is revealed to be spiritual. Not every time, but it happens. More often than not. You know, last week, I, gosh, last week I was in Houston. And I was, uh, I was at a conference and I, I had the privilege of getting to pray for some folks. Um, one of the guys that came forward for prayer was a, he was a pastor. And he was telling us about these anger issues that he's had forever. Before he was a pastor, he was a police officer. And however he was trained, wherever he was, I'm not saying he's every police officer ever, no, but just wherever he was, he learned that the way to control a situation was to exercise dominance and force and amp up and stuff like that. And so he just came to start doing that in life. He would like use anger to bully and intimidate so we're like, okay so me and the other guys like we went to pray for him and 
we rebuked a spirit of anger from him. And when we did, he just, ah, like that, started retching forward, like went doubled down. <laughs> so much, so, like the guy said, everything. Like, he's going to puke and ran to grab a trash bag. It's <laughs> like, okay, well, that was, that was neat. Um, and he experienced a deliverance as the Lord drove this spirit out of him. He's a pastor. Do I think his salvation is in jeopardy? No. Do I think, uh, you know, that he uh, is insincere in his faith? No, I think he's securely in Christ. And yet, when we, uh, if, again, if, if these are to be believed, when we choose to reject the Lord's way, we take off the armor and we open ourselves up to attack. I just think that's how it works. Um, and, I, and so I say this stuff, and I say this to tell you the following, that maybe for you, um, your next step is, as I've been saying stuff, and you're like, oh man, I have this reoccurring thing. And da, da, da. Maybe it's possible it's spiritual. Maybe for you, what, what you need is to go through some prayer. Like the church of Jesus, not just ours, every church that calls on the name of Jesus, are the hands and feet of Christ. And so I would encourage you, look, if you're like, man, maybe I need to confess some stuff, pray through some stuff, see if, if the Lord wants to, to do any kind of like deliverance or whatever, um, you can email us, hello at solidground.church. Um, and we'd be happy to set up some kind of time to pray through and talk through whatever. Um, I, I would hate to just be like, yeah, like you're in a spiritual battle, bye. Um, so if, if that's the thing that you want to do, that, that'd be our honor to pray alongside you and just see what, what's happening there, okay? Um, so all that stuff said, um, I, I want to pray for us. I'm going over. I want to respect your time and get you out so other people can come in. So let me pray for you uh, and then we'll be done for the morning, Okay. Lord Jesus, I thank you because you've given us the decisive victory over Satan. You purchased it on the cross. You disarmed the principalities and rulers and made a public spectacle of them. You canceled our debt and nailed it to the cross. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you because you have not left us as orphans, but you have given us your very own spirit to arm us, protect us, empower us, and change us. Spirit of God, I ask you to illuminate every dark crevice where the enemy would hide. Father, please no longer bring redemption and freedom to these, your children. Pray all this in Jesus' name.